When you look back on your life, will you regret the choices that you made? Let's talk about that, as well as the risks that you might take in life. A little cloud. Is this like Charlie Brown? Little cloud is over poor Chandler, just raining on his parade at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Now, this one had a little bit of a different journey than the rest of the stories in Dubliners. It didn't get written or published at the same time as all the other ones. It was written from February of 1906 to April of 1906. And uh, it was when Ezra Pound kind of, you know, reached out to Mencken from Smartset, the editor, and said uh, to publish this that it finally came out in the May 1915 issue. So nine year difference. That's pretty significant. Maybe that's why this one felt a little bit different than all the rest of Dubliners. And I didn't relate as much to it as I felt like some of the other stories. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because while this is the eighth story, which basically puts it smack dab in the middle of the collection, it was, I think, the second last to be written. It was like he had finished Dubliners at, at one point and came back and wrote three more stories, uh, this, the dead, and one of the other ones. But it was kind of like, it was like a Joyce saw maybe something missing. And he said, I need this in the middle of my story to basically transition to maturity to explain something, maybe. I agree with that. I think that's probably a good idea. I guess maybe, too, is I don't relate to uh, Little Chandler as much because maybe I am right there. Like, I'm at that point in the story of my own personal story. So it's kind of like, am I him? Am I not him? I, mm. I don't feel like I am, am him yet. And maybe in 10 years, if I reread this, I'd be like, oh... Now I get it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I could see that where you maybe don't want to even recognize maybe parts that you associate with. So as usual, we'll have a Before You Read Dubliners video in the playlist for the Dubliners collection down below featuring content that we think you should know before this rather than us repeating it in each of these short stories. Let's move into a quick plot summary recap, and then we'll jump into our discussion and analysis of this short piece. Let's do it. We open at King's Inn with Little Chandler, a man of small and delicate appearance, who's super duper excited to see his friend Gallagher later that day that he has not seen in quite some time. Mr. Gallagher had left Dublin eight years ago as a careless sp uh, spendthrift, but has become a big successful journalist at the London Press since then. Debatable. <laughs> <laughs> as his shift ends, he quickly heads out to meet his friend through a questionable part of town. He spots his friend, who admits the stresses of his job have worn on him, but soon regales him with the tales of Paris and immorality of the world. <laughs> Chandler shares that he has gotten married and now has child. He invites Gallagher over, but is turned down as Gallagher has to leave the next day. His feelings turn to resentment and begins to think about how he surely could have done better. Boo -hoo. He jests that his friend should get married, but Gallagher retorts that it must get stale and he wouldn't marry for love. He'd marry up for money. Ooh. At least he's honest. Chandler returns home and cares for his infant son as his wife had to go out to get some stuff from the store that he may have forgotten. And the child won't stop crying. Eventually, Chandler snaps and yells at him to stop. And he returns <laughs> and scolds him, wondering what he's done to their child. She takes the screaming child from him as Chandler's eyes tear up and plot. You ever screamed at, uh... Your wonderful little son, Mason, like that. I could never see you doing that. <laughs> I think there are lots of elements of Chandler. Now, yelling at him was kind of like a, a symbol of his, this internal regret that I think is building up in him. And I think there's a lot of meaning in this being what I think is his epiphany. But let, let's walk through this a little bit of what led to maybe that regret. What led to him having these pent up emotions? Because what is social mobility would be my first question for you in this piece. So you think that Chandler hasn't moved up. He hasn't had any social mobility and his friend has, and he's jealous of that to be able to move around and do what he wants. Well, social mobility is the idea that there's a currency that if you have this currency, you can move up in this world. And it doesn't matter what I think that is. What matters is what little Chandler thinks his social mobility is. And you'll notice that he spends a lot of time focusing on money 
in this piece. And even just wealth and class is something that has come up several times that we've talked about throughout Dubliners. But I really like the way that James Joyce explored it in this one. Because when he's at the bar, he's passing through what seems to be a pretty rough part of town to me. And we kind of had this question in the boarding house, and we've had a couple of wonderful commenters that talked about the areas of Dublin that are potentially looked down upon, and they confirm some of those class suspicions that we had. And here you'll notice that when he's walking through the streets, he describes the locals as, quote, a horde of grimy children, and quote, vermin-like life. Like he's literally injecting these people with like this filthy lower class status as they they scour like scamper through the streets like he's got to walk through this to get to what is ultimately the more expensive fancy restaurant or bar in town Corless, i guess is kind of like a nickname for the bar okay i can see that i can see money being it i guess my one of the things i thought about like social mobility is his ability to like literally move around i guess i took it too literal because Chandler is restricted to Ireland, right? So it's for me, it was geographical. And I thought, oh, okay. So he he's restricted to living in Ireland and his buddy is going off and living this wonderful, luxurious life as he's going around as this famous, you know, uh, writer. And he's just like, mm, I'm imprisoned in my own life and I have nothing. And you get to see the, you know, the wonderful, you know, spectacles of Paris. And that's so amazing. And I don't have that. I'm I'm stuck here with a kid. And what company does his friend work for? Uh, it's the newspaper, uh, London Press. And Ireland wasn't a independent country at this point in time. Do you remember who was kind of in charge at that point in time? So yeah, the, the King of England is in charge at this point in time. And you'll notice there's even some quotes in this text that I think you kind of picked up on here, maybe even subconsciously, where Chandler thinks the English critics perhaps would recognize him as one of the Celtic school by reason of the melancholy tone of his poems. So you'll see even, you know, I was going down the class to structure, but I don't think we disagree because I think this London and England, well, England and uh, Ireland thing is something that we've seen pop up multiple times in Dubliners. And here you see Chandler's looking for approval from England. He sees how his friend has escaped the, the, the mire of Dublin and escape to, you know, like you said, this like, fancy life in Paris and in England. There's always like that nationality discussion that happens in a lot of Joyce's works at this point in time. Yeah. Haven't we talked about the, the poetry before and that a lot of it, Joyce was saying, catered to the English and the stereotypes and making that distinction between the Irish and the English. And we see that again here, obviously. And for some reason, Chandler is so enthralled that the English, I guess, are better because they've been told that the English are better than them is the vibe that I kind of got from this. I know we've seen that theme throughout Dubliners multiple times. Right. right. Well, and you can even see the, how the language informs him on money and class as well in that regard, because he describes his house as a little house, quote unquote. And when he got home, they were to save money. They kept no servant. So that way his wife could take care of the children because if they had plenty of money to throw around, like at that bar, remember, he was imagining people were going to suck on oysters and drink fancy liqueurs, but he had to order <laughs> the small whiskeys, right? As opposed to his friend that, you know, well, he admits life isn't necessarily perfect, right? His uh, hair was, you know, receding and he said that the job was stressful for him, but he he wouldn't do something as confining a.k.a. how the Irish and Dubliner individuals were confined to Ireland, he wouldn't do anything as confining as getting married. He would use social mobility, money, to marry up, to afford himself more opportunities in life. It's, it's very complex, but it's very clear, too, to me in my reading of the story how Joyce uses money as an escape from being paralyzed by the city, from, from losing your mobility and... To Joyce, you know, you got to remember at this point in his time, he had just, I think his son was six months old when he wrote this story. He had just, just had his first child. I don't mean to say that Chandler is an extension of Joyce, but I think you can write those fears into your characters. And you see the way that he writes his fears of being stuck in Dublin. And he kind of paints marriage and children as one of those things that might change a person's trajectory in life. I also felt like he used Gallagher as a non-likable catalyst for this story, 
where Chandler, you, you kind of like him because you feel sorry for him a little bit. But then his buddy comes in and he's not charming. He's kind of a jerk. And he, for some reason, you know, Chandler's jealous of him, but there's nothing to really be jealous of. It's not like he's super handsome. He's semi-successful. But for some reason, it, it still is this contention between these two men Uh and I don't know, it just kind of made me like Chandler. I made me mad at Chandler. And that's why I guess I had a hard time relating it to it. And then we get to the end of the story where then he is taking out his frustrations on his own child. And it's like, dude, the kid didn't do anything. You made these choices and you should be happy and content with them. You have a person that loves you. You have a stable job. You have a home. And I know it might not be seem as glamorous as your buddy, but his stuff wasn't even painted as glamorous. No, I think you do have a gray situation here. Now, one thing to look at too, maybe, is did you think that Chandler, when he's trying to talk to Gallagher, when he's trying to escape from work, his agency, where is it, right? Because he doesn't get to choose when he leaves work. That's kind of controlled by his job. He it's doesn't true. get to choose how many whiskeys he orders, right? His friend keeps ordering whiskeys. Oh, surely you can have one more for me. When he gets home, does he get to control whether he gets to go back out to get the coffee, fix his... No, he has to watch the child. Like, Gallagher, I think, feels confined. And beyond just quality of life, I think there also is a... Chandler a feels confined. There, Chandler feels confined, sorry. There is a uh, autonomy to life, too. And could... Chandler feel pressure from the fact that maybe he has very little autonomy in his life. So much of his life is being decided by others as he's entering this mature life. He's becoming an, a new father and all these freedoms that he once had are being taken away. And how does he feel as a result? Well, it gets pent up. And like you said, that's his epiphany. He realizes it's finally built up when he does unleash emotionally on his child. Mm, yeah, I kind of just had an epiphany myself when you put it that way. I see the restraint of life on Chandler and he gets no choice in anything in his life. I mean, even something simple, his wife decides how they're going to decorate the house and she decides what they're going to have for dinner and everything about his life and then takes it out on somebody that is helpless. And I kind of see that of, I get in the mundaneness of life as well. And I always say, you know, oh, same day, two bits. And then maybe I have a bad day and I take it out on my students or, you know, I yell at my wife and they, they don't deserve that because I'm stuck in that rut. So, yeah, I, I guess that is a little bit more relatable when I look at it that from that point of view. Well, and I think depends on where you are in your life, too, with how you feel about your agency, too. If Joyce injected this really at, like late in the process of writing all of the stories of Dubliners, what was it about this epiphany specifically is what I wonder is why, why did he choose for this, this Chandler and child to mimic him and his son's life? Maybe like, is there something about this epiphany of the older generation feeling stuck in options and taking it out on the younger generation? Is this a multi-generational epiphany? of how we blame each other for problems. And you'll notice even in the next few stories how there's like the two girls that kind of make fun of the spinster older woman. You've got the man that's al alcoholic and who does he take it out on the younger generation. You'll see how in maturity, these stories have this beginning conversation that happen with the next generation of people that are going to grow up to be Dubliners. Yeah, I mean, it's that midlife crisis, right? You're at the halfway point of your life and you start questioning, did I make the right choices? And you look at the older generation and you're kind of thinking, well, I didn't make their choices. I didn't make their mistakes, so I must be better off. But then you're looking back on the younger, or you're looking at the younger generations and thinking, ah, if I'd only done that different or if I was in their shoes, I could make this choice. And I, I think it is a nice interject, interjected story into the middle there. And it, it is a nice um, bridge between almost the the two parts of the entire novel the beginnings life and the ends of life because i think if you're feeling the the pressures of i wish i would have would would have should have could have right <laughs> and here's a negative yeah. way of yelling verbally at your child that is defenseless etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> i think it's meant to be more you know literal here in terms of like the literary discussion of it but also look at like what would be the positive way 
right? Like, has Chandler gone anywhere? He never took that chance with the newspaper. He's never even really left Dublin, right? They said the farthest he's ever been was the Isle of Man Way, which geographically puts him halfway between Ireland and England, I believe, showing that he's never even left his home country. How do you turn that into a positive, right? Like, instead of venting emotionally like this, how do you have that conversation of the, here's my regrets, here's ways to avoid that and how you could potentially avoid feeling like this? I think it's a conversation that he needs to have with his family and his friends. And I think that when his son is old enough, that's something that he needs to discuss with him and say, you know, look, I love you. I could have done things differently. Um, my life would have been different. I want you to not make those same mistakes uh, to have a better life because isn't that what a lot of parents want? And if he'd maybe been, I don't know, maybe he's a little selfish. And I, I think it's okay at certain times in your life to be a little selfish. But I also think that most parents want the best for their children and that he should have that hard conversation with his his son one day. Most importantly, you guys out there watching right now, what were your thoughts on this story? Were you upset with Chandler? And how did you interpret his epiphany there with yelling at the child? We are traveling story by story through Dubliners. If this sounds like something that you are interested in and having conversations about the different pieces in this book, make sure you check out our playlist down below where we'll post all of our talks that we've had. My name's been Una. We appreciate you guys spending some time with us and make sure you hit that subscribe button to join us. Una out. Crypto out. <laughs>